we're looking at today a focus on Sabbath. The first Sabbath, how Sabbath got morphed into a very legalistic thing by the time of Jesus, but the ultimate Sabbath that God wants for you and for me as well. We have been seeing in this series um, how hyperlinked the stories of just Genesis 1 through 3 are to the rest of our lives. And actually, how throughout the Bible it goes all the way from Genesis 1 through Revelation 21. And um, how all of this fits together and how God's plan for you, for me, is just so glorious and amazing. And I think today, as we look at Sabbath, ironically, I did not think about this. We're talking about rest on a day you lost an hour of sleep. <laughs> and there are some people coming back from Guatemala that could use the whole day just to sleep. Um, but um, hey, sometimes timing is what God does, and I had no idea I was going to do it today. So today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 2. It's the end of the actually the first creation account verses 1 through 3, and we will also be looking at Mark chapter 2 and 3 as we see how Jesus handles the Sabbath as well, what it became, what God intends it to be, and how God wants rest for your souls. So the three points that we're going to be looking at in this message are God's intention for Sabbath that we see in Genesis 2, uh, and then the futility of religion which was happening in the days of Jesus and the finality of Jesus Christ and how he is Lord of the Sabbath and what that all means. So first of all, God's intention for the Sabbath. And you can find this when we read in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Notice how often it says God rested, all the work he had done, all the work he had done, he rested. And you're going like, "Um, huh? I don't know if you think about this, does God need to rest? So why does he? Because the text says he does. I mean, we know from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, pretty obviously, God doesn't need to rest. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So why in the world is God resting? Why is God already setting up within creation, within the first week of creation, this idea of rest, of our sacred rhythm? By the way, I don't know if you know, the first six days of creation in Genesis chapter 1, there are three pairs. You have the day of separation of light and darkness, and then you have a day of uh, creation of living things. You have then a day of the separation of the waters above from the waters below, and a day of populating those, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and then the day of the land and the sea being separated, and then the day of creating the animals on the land as well as human beings. You have three sets, three pairs. Everyone has their counterpart except for the Sabbath. The seventh day is awaiting the future, the ultimate God sets that already in motion in the first week. That's why um, Jürgen Moltmann says this, only the Sabbath of creation is more than very good. It is hallowed, sanctified, and therefore points to creation's future glory. The Sabbath is, as it were, the promise of a future consummation built into the initial creation. So already at the beginning, God has a plan, and it's moving forward, and it's not over Even though God is resting and giving us a chance to rest, accommodating himself to his created order, putting a rhythm into your life and mine so that you are able to rest, to be renewed, recreated. You can't work 24-7, 365, people. Have you noticed? Even when you're young, 
you can burn out really quickly. Um, but God has set this in place, awaiting the final day of rest for us all. By the way, uh, the Babylonians and others, they had creation stories as well. You can read about them, um, the Enuma Elish and all these other stories. And what's fascinating is how different the biblical account of creation is from these. Because in the Babylonian account, human beings are created as a result of the gods, plural, not getting kind of tired. And they don't want to do the dirty work. And so they make human beings to be their slaves, to do all the jobs they don't want to do. Fascinating, right? When does God create humanity? What day? Sixth. What's the next day? Rest. Did he create you for work? Yeah. But the first day you get to enjoy God and him is a day of rest. You were created to mirror God, to image him, to reflect his glory. You were created in his image, and he set the first day as a day of enjoyment. Because God didn't need to rest. He wasn't tired. But he steps back, in a sense, or he settles into his creation and is just thrilled at what he sees. And what he sees is Adam, Eve, the garden, the beauty, the glory, intimate fellowship. Doesn't last long. Maybe only one Sabbath. Who knows exactly? And Adam and Eve decide you know, to take it on themselves, right? I want to uh, set myself in charge of the universe the way I want it. They usurp God's place, take his place, and all of a sudden they are cast out of Eden where they now are dealing with the toil and sweat of work in a drudgery kind of way. And I would dare say, doesn't take long, and religion begins. Genesis 4. I don't know if you know that story. I think we've shared it, actually, in a series. Um, it's the story of Cain and Abel. And Cain becomes the first religious person that I know of because he sits there and he makes a sacrifice to God of some of the fruit of the land that he had toiled and sweat at. He puts it on the altar and then expects God to be pleased with him and that performance that he did and therefore reward him. And God does not. That's religion. That's the order of religion. God's intention for Sabbath, for Cain, for Abel, for Adam, for Eve, for you, for me, for all of us, his intention is that we would rest in his grace, rest in his presence, have communion with him, fellowship with him, first and foremost of all. The first full 24 hours that we had with God would be for that. We don't work and then rest. We rest and then work. That's the order of creation. But religion took over. Boy, did it. By the time of Jesus, we saw what religion did to the Sabbath as well. We're going to look at now the futility of that religion. And we'll read the first account in Mark chapter 3, 1 through 6, where Jesus, for a second time, for a second time, it seems like two Sabbaths in a row, break the rules that religion set up. We read, again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. There's so many contrasts in this. By the time that Jesus comes into the picture, 
in the biblical narrative. We find out that the Sabbath has gotten saddled with hundreds and hundreds of more rules, regulations, categories. In fact, in the Babylonian Talmud, we find 39 different categories, 39 different categories of things you could not do on the Sabbath. Now, if you read through the Torah itself, the first five books of Moses, you don't find that many. You find things like you can't start a fire on the Sabbath. Don't walk too far from your house on the Sabbath. Don't plow in the field on the Sabbath. But it doesn't have 39 categories of things you better not do on the Sabbath. That comes as a result of, this, of religion taking over. For a legal-minded person who's anxious about doing everything right and to the T, who becomes obsessed and, and compelled to do everything just the way it's supposed to be because they are looking, like Cain, to please God in order to get him to do them favors and or so that God owes them, you're going to keep adding rules upon rules upon rules upon rules upon rules in order to make sure that you're better than or have made the grade. So when Jesus comes to the synagogue and the leaders look at him, notice a few things. He is there saying and redefining what the Sabbath is really for or bringing it back to the original, which is for recreation, renewal, for healing, for wholeness, for communion, for celebration. And they're just standing back, probably arms crossed, looking at him in judgment and he says, now, do you want to heal or kill? Notice by the end of this passage, they're ready to kill him. They are ready to kill him. They were so insecure and anxious about their own status. They were so tribal, so self-obsessed and judgmental because that's what religion is. To understand it a little more, let's look at the Sabbath before, Mark chapter 2. One Sabbath, it says, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but for the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Profound statement. The Sabbath was made for for human beings, not human beings for the Sabbath. Jesus is talking about the difference between a paradigm called religion and the paradigm called the gospel. One is life-giving. The other is life-taking. One is seeing the moral law, the Sabbath, that can be a blessing and can lead to human flourishing because it's meant to give us rest and rhythm in our lives. The other, it becomes a burden and enslaves. It's the difference that Jesus offers compared to what they had manufactured themselves. You see, most people, even today, if they believe in God, think the way that you relate to God is somehow you have to perform something first. You know, you have to uh, be good do good things, then God can reward you. You're in good with God. And so, now, there's a million variations on this throughout uh, the religious world. Some systems have more rules. Some have a few less rules. Most systems, in my estimation, though, religion systems have just enough rules so that the majority of people don't quite cut, cut it, you know? So that the bell curve is such that the majority of people aren't going to make it unless they really try hard. And since most people don't, we know it's only the 10 or 20 percent that are actually making the grade, hitting the standard. And you can feel good that you're in that part of the bell curve if you do all those rules. 
Now, some systems are more nationalistic, ethnic-based, where you're part of this group based on your culture and this, that, and the other thing, and all these little boundary markers. Others are more spiritualistic, that is, meditative practices and other systems of detaching oneself from the material world to be in a different plane and different state than the majority. And some are extremely ascetic, that is, moralistic, regimented, that few people are disciplined enough to do. But all of them basically say, I perform, and then I am accepted. Christianity is not only different than that. Christianity is antithetical to that. Religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. Christianity says, I am accepted, and only then do I obey. The gospel is not that I give something to God and then he owes me. It's not a deal. It's not a contract. It's not a bargaining chip. You don't get to lobby God on your behalf to get anywhere with him. You don't offer God anything. God offers it all to you. The gospel proclaims that God has given you a complete salvation, that you were made to be in communion with him, and he gives it to you freely by his grace. It's not cheap. No, it cost him everything to do this. Jesus Christ offers his whole life for you to have fellowship with God. But then, it's only then that you respond in this. Now, religion, you can feel like you're saved because you're doing it better than others, right? Christianity says you are saved when you realize you're not any better than anyone else. In fact, you might even consider yourself worse than everybody else. So why Douglas John Hall, in one of his books, says this, Christianity is not a religion, period. Period. And he goes on, the collection of writings, the Bible, accumulated over a period of thousands of years, contains an extraordinarily consistent and often intense quarrel with religion. And we see that here in this text. We see this with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what they are doing in this text, the Pharisees and the Herodians, is that they think somehow if they have kept the rules good enough, God is going to do something for Israel for themselves. And so they are so concerned with every possible detail that they keep writing more and more rules into the rule book because they just don't know if they've done enough. So in a sense... They can't see the forest for the little trees of all the rules they put in front of them. Here's a trustworthy statement. Religion kills. You might go like, what? Yep, it kills. The more you try to keep the law, the more you're focusing on laws and rules and regulations, the more you won't even see the people in front of you and in their need. We see that specifically with the man with the withered hand in front of both the Pharisees and Jesus at that synagogue, and all they can see are the rules, whereas Jesus sees the need. You see, religion is so self-focused, self-salvation-focused, that it's all about me, that there is no love at all in it. You cannot, if, if you set down rules for how you have to love, You won't be loving, you'll just be following the rules. And the gospel works totally different than this. The gospel says salvation is already a gift. It's already been given you. And the law is here not for you to focus on it, but to take you you out of yourself so you can see other people and their needs. You aren't obsessed at trying to complete it and be perfect in it because God has done that for you. Rather, you are able to respond from being accepted by God to serve others and not worry about, quote, am I keeping all the little regulations? So Jesus gets angry at these religious folks on the Sabbath because they're actually violating the Sabbath with their rules, not completing it or keeping it. But notice in the text, um, (laughs) 
Jesus is not the only one that got angry that day. It said that the Pharisees and the Herodians get together and plot to destroy Jesus. Now, that might just be a throwaway line for you, but if you understand the history at that time and the culture at that time, these two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians, are as diametrically opposed to each other as you can imagine. Um, the Herodians were aligned with the occupying power of Rome itself. They were the secularists who brought in all sorts of neo-pagan rituals and practices and said, yeah, we can accommodate to all that stuff. We should be speaking Greek. We should be living like the Greeks. We shouldn't be any different. Than... And the Pharisees are like, no, 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 no. They were the nationalistic religious people who were so militant about being separate from any other culture, creating their own. To apply it to our day and age, the Herodians are from the blue states and the uh, Pharisees are from the red states. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? The Herodians are the irreligious and the Pharisees are those religious nationalists. They disagree on almost everything, but one thing they want to do together, get rid of Jesus. And that tells you something about the gospel. It is not religion, and it's not irreligion. Okay? It's not moralism, and it's not relativism. It's not traditional moral values, and it's not do whatever feels good. It's neither. Now, today, these two tribes are competing all the time in our society, right? And they're both using <laughs> coercive techniques. They're both using tactics of force. One is for moral conformity, the other is for self-discovery. And the Bible says both ways are just trying to be your own savior and Lord and lead your own life. Moralists will say, good people are in and the bad people are out. Secularists say, the open-minded are in and those narrow-minded, judgmental people are out. And what you will notice about both sides of all the issues today is that there's so much self-righteousness. You know, we are so much better than those people who think they are better than other people. Isn't that amazing how that happens? There is self-righteousness on all sides. Liberal, conservative, north versus south, the coast versus the flyover Midwest, Democrats and Republicans, college-educated, skilled labor, urban and rural. Every division in our society is filled with self-righteousness. And if you think, oh, I'll just move to the other group, well, that doesn't really solve anything. And if you say, I'm just going to get out of all groups altogether, that doesn't solve anything either. What the gospel says is not good people are in and bad people are out, nor the open-minded are in and the narrow-minded are out, but that the broken people are in. And those who think they are well healed are out. The sinners are in and the self-righteous are out. Now, one last thing before we move off this point, because it's so easy, and it has bothered me since I was a child. I don't like to preach about those people out there, because anytime you do that, you can create self-righteousness in the people who happen to be present, like those people who don't go to church, those people who are not here this morning, those people who don't do this, do that. There can be so much self-righteousness within Christianity as well. And the reason is, is because the default mode of our heart is to fall back into religion. Why? Because we control it, you know? Cain is a good example. He was trying to control the whole situation, you know? I give this to God. He should be blessing me. I'm the firstborn. I, I deserve this. And then when he can't, control God, he takes it out on his brother, right? It's so easy to do that. And that's why what needs to be proclaimed in any church service at any time for anybody is what we call the gospel, the good news 
of what God has done for us. If, I don't, if you don't hear that, you don't get anything, really. That's so why Martin Luther, in his 95 theses, when he nailed those to that church door in 1517, the first one says this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. In other words, we begin every day anew. We don't progress every day is coming back and receiving God's grace and salvation as a gift. It's no more than embracing God's grace, receiving that salvation. Now, probably today, I don't really need to talk about those who might be skeptical of Christianity. Usually, they don't show up in worship too often. I wish they did. But um, I still want to share a little and say, you know, you might be looking at Christianity right now And you might say, well, I don't see the difference between Christianity and religion at all. And um, boy, you might have a point because too much of what we are seeing in our society and around the world is our default mode going back into the religious self-righteousness that we have. And so, sorry to say, there's a warrant to saying, I don't want whatever that is because it's not the real thing. Too often, Christians have shown the world something other than Christianity. So if you're wondering about all this, let's talk. Tell me about the God you don't believe in, and I probably don't believe in that one too. Tell me about the Christianity you find hypocritical and judgmental, and I'll probably agree with you. That's why it's just so amazing in this text again, the finality of Jesus Christ and how this comes up. Mark 2, 27, 28. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God didn't create the Sabbath because he needed it. God created the Sabbath for the sake of humanity. And it says, by the way, not... The Sabbath is made for some people and not others. The Sabbath is made for all human beings. You need Sabbath. You need break. You need to stop. You cannot work 24-7, 365. It's not good for you. It's not the way God set you up. We have limits, and we need to realize them. And Jesus, in this text, is trampling on all sorts of burdens and religious legalism around the Sabbath. He's blowing away the paradigms that the Pharisees have. He says, the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. Do you understand what a shocking claim that is? It's not even veiled, really. And uh, the Pharisees would look at him stunned, going like, I cannot believe you just said that. Because Jesus is claiming that the one who set up the Sabbath, the one who oversees the Sabbath, the one who decides and defines what Sabbath is, that happens to be me. What? That happens to be me. Jesus understands that there is an uncreated God who made all of creation and all that's going on and holds it all together, and he is claiming with this phrase, I am the Lord of Sabbath. I am that Sabbath. Now, I know there's a lot of people who want to say, well, you know, Jesus, I really like Jesus. He's he's got a lot of nice things to say. I wonder sometimes if they've actually read the nice things he had to say because so many of the things he had to say were as shocking as this. And either he is the most egotistical person on planet Earth, and we've got some big egos these days, But to basically say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, that's pretty big stuff. Just like, um, I have the authority to forgive sins as if they were done against me. That he also says in the Gospel of Mark. So either he's the most egotistical person, or he's lying through his teeth and people are believing him. Or he's kind of out of his own mind, deceived, a lunatic, And somehow everybody doesn't think he's out of his mind, which is really odd, or he is who he says he is. 
And what he's saying here is rather shocking. This is why N.T. Wright, in one of his books, puts it this way. How can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human, that the fire has become flesh, that life, capital L, itself has walked into our midst? Christianity either means that or it means nothing. It is the most devastating disclosure of the deepest reality in the world, or it is a sham, a total nonsense. Most people unable to cope with saying either of those things are condemned to live in the shadow, shallow world in between. In this text, again, you can reject him like the Pharisees and the Herodians and seek to destroy him, or you bow down and worship him. Nobody just says, how nice, Jesus. That was a nice thing to say. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You need it. You need him to be the Lord of your Sabbath to be your rest. In fact, that's what you will say in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who we are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, I think the Sabbath is not just this day set aside, filled with rules and regulations like the Pharisees want to make it into these particulars. It, and it's, it is moving forward to the ultimate rest that you will have. But there are two levels of rest that you need. You do need a break every week. You need time off. You cannot, and you are not God, and you cannot keep running on empty for long. That's one level of rest. But I think there's a deeper level of rest you need as well that Jesus is getting at. Even if you have a day off a week, even if you do, um, are meticulous about stopping for one day a week, you have a deeper need, an ultimate need, You need to be given rest from having to prove yourself to this world or anyone else. You need a rest from having to be your end all and be all. There is an inner anxiety that we all face, a restlessness that we know we're not quite satisfied. We never do anything quite right. We always want more, need more, can think there are more things to do You need rest from that. And that's why the book of Hebrews talks about kind of that ultimate rest. When it says, then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. That's the second level you need to realize I don't need to do anything. I am the Lord's. And that can't be taken away from me. To enter into God's rest, into the completed work of Jesus Christ. He is the one who upon the cross faced the restlessness and the anger and anxieties of the world and finally said, it is finished. He didn't say, it's partially done. I've done 90%, do your 10%. He said, it is finished. It's complete so you can rest. The work underneath the work, in a sense. What makes you really weary? The need to prove yourself or to be something. You can rest from all of that. There's nothing to prove you are approved. There is nothing to do. It's all been done. It's all been completed. And that's what's so amazing about the ultimate rest that God will bring the rest that you can have right now, the way Sabbath is actually worked out because Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath means he is your rest and you can rest in him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day, for this series, for this time of the year as we approach uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday at the end of this month, Lord. Teach us how um, what you began what you created as good, what we (laughs) marred with our fallen brokenness and rebellion, Lord, that you are redeeming it all and you are going to recreate this world and we're going to be a part of it, Lord. We trust you. You know how broken we are, how incomplete we are, Lord. Thank you for giving us rest, for being our rest, that we can commune with you today, that we can 
have the rhythms in our life of letting go, of not playing God, of letting you be our God, our Lord, our Savior. Jesus, as you are Lord of the Sabbath, may you be Lord over all our lives. Lord, in so many ways, <laughs> we try to deceive you and we can't. If we say we have no sin, all we do is deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us, but when we confess our sins, you, Lord, are faithful and just. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For this we thank you, Lord God, that we can rest in that grace, that we don't have to play the religion game, but can live, Lord, in response to your goodness and grace in our lives, to give thanks to you and serve others, Lord, without concern. Lord God, we um, ask that you'd um, truly prepare our hearts to receive and be open to all that you give in the Lord's Supper this day. Lord Jesus, we are amazed that you offer yourself in your fullness to be a part of our lives, and we thank you for that. We ask, Lord, as well, that you prepare us to respond in grace, in thanksgiving, Lord, by giving of our um, our, our, um, our, our financial resources for your kingdom. These are just tokens of our whole lives, Lord. We offer the whole thing to you, Lord. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because you have done what no one else can do, Lord. We thank you for these things. Bless our time, Lord, now as we give of ourselves through our offerings and as we pre are prepared for the Lord's table this day. All this we pray, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.